My name is Alex George and I'm an Ansible solution specialist. And today I'm going to be talking about how I can use Ansible to actually set up an Ansible development server. So this builds off on a previous video that I did that did everything through the command line. Now I've gone through the process of creating Ansible playbooks and roles to actually build out not just code server and Ansible navigator, but even setting up more of the development environment for the end user. So what does this Ansible role do? So it goes through the process of downloading and installing code server leveraging variables for the actual version of code server so you can specify exactly what version they want to use. Actually deploying certificates. So if you do want to leverage SSL, I can set up those as part of this process. I set up the systemd service file specific for what user you want this to be set up as. So if you have separate users for Ansible versus a networking team versus a Linux team, you've got that capability including different ports. So obviously each team may have a different port that they want that web interface available to them on. That's all part of this deployment. Then I actually deploy the base code server settings in the Ansible extension, so everything is set up for them. I go through the process of installing Ansible Navigator, including some base Ansible settings, so the actual Ansible Navigator.yaml file, a base inventory, as well as a base Ansible.cfg to point to that inventory. This means that they can very quickly get through you know, the initial starting points of development by just logging into that web interface. Because I'm leveraging Ansible Navigator, I also install Podman and Git, so I know generally there is some sort of source control process built in, so I do deploy Git so you can easily start with that process as well. And then I pull in the starting execution environment that is added into both Ansible Navigator as well as added into um, the Ansible Code Server extension. So it gives you that capability right off the bat to start leveraging automation without really needing to set up anything else. So this is all done for me using Ansible Core 2.14.0, and there are three collections that I leverage. Those are all stored in the repository, so you can see exactly what collections I leverage if you want to deploy this yourself. So I already have a RHEL 8 server up and running, and I've actually run this once to deploy for myself. But now I'm going to set up a second user, in this case, an Ansible user under a different port, so in this case, 8080. So I'm going to get that started to actually have this uh, set up as we go through. But then I'll walk through that role that's in my repository that I'll share at the end. So I talked about the collections that exist. So I'm just leveraging three collections for this. One, if you're leveraging 443, if not, you can actually exclude this collection. Then I use containers.podman to pull in the execution environment for the end user so everything's ready to go. And then ansible.posix to actually make sure all the firewall roles are set up. As far as the playbook itself goes, this is all variableized to make it as easy as possible. So if you're connecting to either a private automation hub or some sort of password protected registry like registry.redhat.io, that's included as part of this process. So I could pull in that execution environment. Then what user you actually want to set up this development server for. So if you want a generic Ansible user or a Linux user or an actual specific user, I can do that here. What port I want to give them access to to set up the actual web interface. And then if you want to deploy certs, all that's included as well as what execution environment I want to set up both for Ansible Navigator as well as the Ansible extension. So all of this is provided as part of this role. The tasks themselves are really as simple as downloading the code server and installing it, handling that certificate process, making sure the systemd service file is set, including applying the certs if I'm leveraging them, making sure the custom fact directories exist so I can actually make sure all the configurations are pre-deployed so the user doesn't have to set up code server or the actual directories for themselves. I make sure all those defaults, defaults are populated over, including the nice color theme, making sure the, that execution environment is set for the Ansible extension. All of that's provided. I then make sure all of that's included for the code server itself so it knows to deploy with those certificates and binding to that specific port. I also go through the process of deploying an Ansible Navigator config to use that execution environment that we talked about earlier and an ansible.cfg to use that inventory that I'm gonna copy over, which is just gonna have the inventory host name and then blank spots for Ansible user and Ansible password. I install that Ansible extension so it's ready to go for the end user, set up if there are requirements for leveraging 443, reload and everything and start that code server, install Podman and Git. I leverage Podman as my container engine for Ansible Navigator, and I wanna make sure Git is available so I can leverage source control. I actually install Ansible Navigator, pull in that execution environment. So again, that end user doesn't need to do any work. Make sure all the ports are properly set up. I like to have the user lingering so I don't have to worry about Podman issues if I continue to pull multiple EEs or anything like that. This simplifies that process. And then I actually display that web link and 
restart things as necessary based on what goes on. So if I need to restart the code server or firewall D, all of that's handled. And then for my default variables, I just have that GitHub link to the uh, code server, and then you can change the variables. So if you want to have a specific version rolled out across your entire environment, or you want to upgrade it, I can simply just change this version number to match what exists in the environment. So as you can see, that playbook finished. Um, didn't have to do much because I already had this deployed, um, but it's actually deployed out to the end user. Obviously, all the certificates are already there, but I want to go to this web link. So I'm going to go to 26, and I'll even bring this up full screen. And here's that web link for that specific user, so the Ansible user. I will go to that link, and it will show me, A, that I'm in as that particular user. You'll see that everything's already set up, so it will give me that dark color theme already. That inventory is there. That ansible.cfg is there. But also, I already have the extension installed with my execution environment already included. So I've got fully qualified collection names. I have my execution environment enabled, and I have that image. So if I go to create a new playbook, so let's just call it, you know, ec2.yaml, I can go through the process and see, A, it's going to start pulling in that execution environment. And then it'll actually, as I do this and save, it'll show me everything as part of this process. In this case, I don't care about gathering facts, so I'll set that as false. Let's do tasks, name, create, ec2. And now, because it finished pulling in all the docs into this, so I can actually do ec2 instance. And there you go. You can already see the syntax highlighting already built in without the user needing to set up anything. So they can just go in, update the inventory to match what they want, or they can jump into the terminal, pull down repositories, and that will show up here as well. So I've really simplified a lot of the process for the end user to get their own development environment set up. And really all I need to change to make this usable for different teams is either change that execution environment image or change the user and port. So I can spread this out across multiple users with one server to manage this entire process. So that role is maintained in my repository with all those comments. So you can pull it down, leverage it, modify for your specific needs. If you're pulling from Quay, obviously you don't necessarily need uh, that username and password, but it gives you that flexibility to set up your development environment with a single playbook. And I can add as many users as I need into a single environment. So again, it increases the flexibility of developing at scale. So I want to thank everyone for taking the time out, learn a little bit more about how you can use Ansible to set up Ansible development servers. Thank you.